In this video, we'll provide background and clinical data on bioprosthetic valve fracture, or BVF, as well as present several vignettes for cases. High residual gradients following valve and valve TAVR remain in Achilles' heel for this procedure, with 32% of patients in the valve and valve registry having reported severe PPM after implantation. Bench testing demonstrated that some, but not all, surgical valves could be fractured to allow optimal expansion of the transcatheter heart valve. Furthermore, in recent clinical experience, BVF resulted in reduced residual gradients and increased valve EOA following valve and valve TAVR. In a recent 75 patient, 21 center, uh, multi center, uh, report, residual gradients were significantly reduced following BVF. Baseline gradient in the failing surgical valve was approximately 41 millimeters of mercury. Following valve and valve TAVR, that gradient was significantly reduced to 19, but was still elevated. After BVF, mean residual transvalvular gradient was now reduced to less than 10. How do you do this? The first thing you need to do is check that the surgical valve that you're working with can actually be refractured or remodeled. These are the U.S. surgical tissue valves that can currently be fractured. The setup for BVF is fairly simple. It requires an end deflator and a 60cc syringe with a non-compliant balloon, a high-pressure stopcock, and high-pressure tubing. Once you initiate rapid ventricular pacing, the stopcock is positioned so that you can do a rapid inflation of the uh, non-compliant balloon with a hand inflation uh, from the 60cc syringe. The stopcock is then turned to allow a rapid inflation of the end deflator uh, until fracture occurs. Here's an example. And you can see that the classic sign of the waste being released um, at the time of fracture uh, in this very nice video. Confirmation of fracture, however, is best seen with an acute drop in the end deflator pressure. The balloon waste will sometimes be very clearly seen as in the last video, but this can be quite subtle and shouldn't be relied on to indicate that fracture has occurred. And finally, 10, 11. an audible snap or pop may be heard coming from the patient when you get a fracture. Some valves can't be fractured, but they can be remodeled, and we term this bioprosthetic valve remodeling, or BVR. The early Carpentier Edwards valves and the Paramount 2700 that have very characteristic um, fluoroscopic appearance are some of that can be stretched. And then the newer Inspiris valve can also be stretched due to its expansion joint. In bioprosthetic valve remodeling, here's an example of a 21 millimeter Paramount 2700 uh, in which we placed a 23 millimeter S3. Mean gradient after valve and valve TAVR was an unacceptable 41 millimeters of mercury. You could be critical of the implant depth, but at the time, uh, flaring of the valve in a 50-50 position was how it was recommended to do this. We now know that achieving optimal implant gradients requires the valve to be placed quite shallow. Nonetheless, we had an unacceptable gradient, and we fractured the true, or, the, or we stretched the device with a true balloon inflated to 22 atmospheres. You can see the valve foreshortened um, and clearly getting expansion of the paramount. And our mean gradient now was 17 millimeters of mercury, which would be acceptable. Finally, BVR might involve valves that can't be stretched or fractured, but can be bent. The St. Jude trifecta, with its very malleable but robust and unfracturable titanium frame, is an example of such a valve. Here is what a 21 millimeter trifecta with a true ID of 19 millimeters looks like on the bench. 
Following dog boning of a 22 millimeter true balloon to 10 atmospheres, the posts of the trifecta are bent out obliquely to about 115 degrees, as you can see in the image to the far left. This allows the a superannular valve, which is implanted at a zero depth, to have better expansion in the superannular position and not be constrained by the perpendicular valve post. Here is what it looks like using a uh, trifecta and a portico transcatheter heart valve. Pre-BVR on the left, the posts are at 90 degrees. Post remodeling with a dog bone balloon, the posts are now at 115 degrees. Our early clinical experience shows that this has been quite successful at relieving PPM when doing valve in valve, particularly in small trifectas. Finally, some valves can't be fractured, bent, or stretched, and these would include the Medtronic Avalis and the Medtronic Hancock II. Obviously, there's going to be complications in this population who are at high risk for procedures, but in our 75 patient 21 center multi center evaluation, there were no coronary occlusions, no annular ruptures, and no new pacemakers. Obviously, there are important caveats to achieving these types of results. The first is picking the right patient and avoiding coronary obstruction. We know that following valve and valve TAVR, the risk of coronary obstruction is higher than in native valve TAVR. Virtual transcatheter heart valve to coronary distance, or VTC, is a crucial parameter you have to anticipate a three to four millimeter increase in the diameter of the surgical valve following BVF and calculate the VTC based on that virtual implant. Here's an example of a VTC with a virtual 23 millimeter transcatheter heart valve that is less than one millimeter for both the right and left coronaries. This patient would be at high risk for valve and valve TAVR, let alone valve and valve and BVF, unless a mitigating strategy such as Basilica was implemented. Is the timing of BVF important? Obviously, you can do BVF before the valve and valve TAVR. The pro of this is that there's no high pressure inflation of the TAVR prosthesis. The con is the risk for severe AI of the degenerative surgical prosthesis and the potential for underexpansion of the transcatheter heart valve. You can do BVF after valve and valve TAVR. The pro of this is that you get optimal expansion of the TAVR prosthesis, but the con is that the transcatheter valve leaflets will see a high pressure inflation that could lead to acute or subacute injury to the TAVR valve. Is there a hemodynamic benefit to doing it one way or the other? We think there is, and it should be done BVF after valve and valve TAVR. Looking once again at our large multi-center database, baseline gradient was approximately 41. The final gradient, regardless of how you did uh, fracturing and the timing of fracture, was 9.2. But if you separate out patients that had BVF after valve and valve TAVR versus BVF first, clearly patients that had BVF after valve and valve TAVR had significantly lower final mean gradients. And in fact, in our multivariable model, the strongest single independent predictor for final lowest mean gradient was the timing of BVF, i.e. you perform BVF after valve and valve TAVR. Obviously, one of the concerns, though, of this technique is that the when performing BVF before valve and valve TAVR, does the high pressure inflation risk causing subclinical injury to the leaflets that might lead to accelerated leaflet calcification and impact long-term durability? We utilized an animal model and an accelerated leaflet calcification model. Uh, we performed valve and valve TAVR on the bench, implanting a 23 millimeter Sapien 3 valve into a 21 millimeter Magna that had a true ID of 19. There were two groups, BVF before TAVR and BVF after TAVR. 
the fracture threshold was similar to what we reported from our bench testing and ranged from 18 to 22 atmospheres. There was no injury that was grossly observed to the transcatheter heart valve leaflets in either group. Leaflets were then excised or removed and 62 samples from each group were implanted intramuscularly into New Zealand rabbits. Rabbits were survived for a mean of 60 days followed by calcium content testing. When the animals were sacrificed and analyzed, there was no difference in calcium content between BVF before valve and valve TAVR or BVF after valve and valve TAVR, suggesting that at least in this uh, accelerated leaflet calcification model, um, the leaflets were not being injured uh, by a high pressure inflation during BVF. We obviously want to pick the right size transcatheter heart valve. So once again, BVF optimizes expansion of the transcatheter valve and allows the constrained transcatheter heart valve to expand to its optimal diameter. You need to anticipate an increase in three to four millimeters in diameter following valve fracture when you select the transcatheter heart valve. Optimal expansion aside from decreasing the mean residual final gradient is an important goal uh, of BVF. Here's an example from the group in uh, Vancouver uh, in which they implanted a 23S3 into a 21 millimeter microflow. Clearly before BVF with the implant at a zero depth, there's clear leaflet pinwheeling, which we know impacts negatively long-term valve durability. Following BVF, however, the pinwheeling is essentially absent, suggesting optimal expansion of the transcatheter heart valve with its potential positive impact on long-term durability. These are two valves that were removed at two years and two and a half years following implant valve and valve uh, prior to us beginning to do BVF. Under expansion of the transcatheter heart valve may certainly impact valve durability. Let's look at our first vignette to put to use uh, how we would do this and the information that I've provided you in the previous slides. Here's an 88 year old female with a failing 21 millimeter magna with a 51 millimeter mean gradient. She was at very high risk with an STS prom of 14%. Our plan was valve and valve TAVR with BVF and she had adequate iliofemoral access for delivery of the transcatheter valve. When selecting the transcatheter heart valve, the true ID of the 21 magna is 19 millimeters. You once again would anticipate a four millimeter increase in diameter after BVF. And thus you would select either a 23 millimeter Sapien 3 or a 23 millimeter Evolute R. You would then assess coronary obstruction risk, which in this case was quite low. And then you would decide on what balloon to use. If you're using Sapien 3, historically in our bench testing, we fractured valves with a balloon that was one millimeter larger than the labeled valve size. Our goal now is to try to get optimal expansion to nominal for the transcatheter heart valve. Thus, in this case, we would select a 23 millimeter true balloon or a 23 millimeter Atlas Gold to do the BVF. Thus, the S3 would be perfectly expanded uh, following fracture. It's slightly different if using a Medtronic core valve. We know that the core valve has a constrained area where the leaflets are attached to the frame. In the case of a 23 millimeter Evolute R, the constrained area measures 20 millimeters. And we know that you have to use a balloon that is no bigger than two millimeters larger than the constrained area. Thus, in this case, we would use a 22 millimeter true balloon. And in addition, it's very important to position that balloon very ventricular so that the shoulder of the non-compliant balloon is at or below the constrained area. 
because the balloon is very ventricular, it's important that the wire is not tangled or involved in the mitral apparatus to avoid injury to the mitral valve. In this particular case, the mean gradient after insertion of the valve was 24 millimeters, clearly in the PPM range, and in our experience and others, not acceptable. We performed BVF in this case with a 23 millimeter Atlas Gold, and the, the valve fractured at 18 atmospheres, and our final mean gradient was 9 millimeters, which we felt was very, uh, very uh, acceptable. Let's look at a second vignette uh, that illustrates how BVF may facilitate placing a more appropriately sized and optimally expanded trend catheter valve. Here is a 23 millimeter magna with a true ID of 21 millimeters. Of... If you look at the valve and valve app for a 23 magna, it would recommend a 23 S3 or a 26 Evolute R. We did valve and valve taver and selected a 26 S3. This was at a zero implant and had a mean gradient in the PPM range of 22 millimeters of mercury. We then selected a 26 millimeter true balloon. So we right sized this balloon to the 26 millimeter S3, performed BVF with fracture occurring at 18 atmospheres and our final mean gradient was nine millimeters of mercury. In conclusion, BVF can be performed safely and results in reduced residual gradients. Best hemodynamic results are achieved by performing BVF after valve and valve taver. The high pressure inflation does not result in accelerated calcification of the transcatheter heart valve leaflets, at least with an Edwards Sapien 3 valve uh, in an accelerated animal model. And certainly longer follow up determined BVS impact on clinical outcomes and its effect on transcatheter heart valve durability, either positive or negative, is needed.